and I'll set my timer. All right, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we've been doing, um, been involved with uh, the Utah Transit Authority uh, in collaboration with them doing some uh, work to uh, try and better plan for uh, individuals with disabilities and other disadvantaged populations and their uh, public transportation system access. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, and discuss that. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, I'm going to watch the time very carefully. I know as we're getting close. So um, just as kind of a background, just uh, we're really focused on uh, community integration, on how people with disabilities are integrated into the community environment. And their integration is really dependent on their ability to participate in activities of daily living in, in the community, uh, the no normative community environment, and how easy uh, that is for them to do. Um, access to transportation is both an activity of daily living as well as supports the other activities of daily living. So it becomes a very critical factor in, in uh, community integration. And the disability community has really identified transportation as like one of their top three factors or, um, that they're focused on. Um, and we look at transportation as just the careful planning and coordination of transportation is really necessary in order to um, plan for individuals with disabilities equitable access to the services and supports uh, that they need for participating in these activities of daily living and really to prevent isolation and discrimination and a lot of the uh, negative um, uh, participation uh, barriers that, that are really faced. So um, due in part really to the dispersed development pattern in many communities, transportation is just one of these, it's with housing and employment as these uh, critical factors in community integration. So um, we're trying to pay special attention to how we plan and implement um, our transportation systems. And we have the opportunity to really um, participate with Utah Transit Authority as they tried to take a, a different approach to um, their trans transit planning uh, to meet the needs of uh, dis transit, transportation disadvantaged populations. So, so purpose of our study uh, was to examine uh, really UTA's bus and light rail service patterns in the Wasatch Front of Utah and here it says the spatial temporal organization of individuals with disabilities activities of daily living. I want to state right at the beginning that the temporal, the time aspects of doing this, uh, we did not do. There were just numerous difficulties um, which we were running into and so it really became the spatial organization um, and really the timing of it is kind of the, the next step as we continue developing basically this approach. Uh, that we're going to have to address. Um, so we used uh, really some methods that were similar to others that have been used by like uh, Curry in Australia, uh, Amoroso, um, really to uh, conduct, uh, it's pretty simple, um, honestly, it's, it's basically a, uh, uh, a needs gap assessment or aggregate um, analysis that we are doing where we basically have three factors um, we have an index of transportation provision or supply, which is really an infrastructure uh, based measure of the transportation service uh, provision that's available um, within the study area. And then we have an index of transportation need. And within there, there's really the typical people based approach to this where we're looking at socioeconomic factors that are known to be associated with transportation disparity. So we looked at those um, and that's pretty common uh, to look at those now as people are starting, uh, as researchers and, and other organizations are starting to look at kind of equity issues. They're using these socioeconomic factors uh, really to, to focus more on transportation disadvantaged populations. But at the same time, um, looking at these aggregate measures, we added to the index of transportation need a land use based factor. Um, which was really meant to measure um, access opportunities to activities of daily living. 
and I'll kind of ex explain that a little bit more as, as we're going through. But, um, but it was adding really this land use based measure to the socioeconomic factors that give us a little better picture of not only what the, of, of what the real need is for people's socioeconomic um, uh, situation as well as the area in which they find themselves residing. And then it's really just this comparison of supply versus need. So it's the kind of formula that, formula that I like because it's just subtraction. So, and I can do that. Um, so, and then we get this basically this index of uh, transportation uh, disparity. Um, so it was really a proof of concept uh, based on uh, the ability of UTA to, to use the data and to replicate it in an ongoing matter, as well as the availability of data we'd find in like a US context. Some of these prior studies that have done these kinds of things, um, some of the socioeconomic data that they used were just not available to us uh, be, uh, because of the limitations with US census and other kinds of data approaches. So, um, so just for the context, really briefly, um, this is the UTA service area primarily uh, for the Utah Transit Authority. It's four counties, uh, Weber, Davis, Salt Lake, and Utah counties. This is where the majority of the population of Utah resides within, uh, within the state. It's about uh, 3,600 square miles of land area. Um, there were uh, 2.17 million people there, which is about 75% uh, of the population of Utah. Um, and really 8.8% of the population are individuals with disabilities. It's the fast growing area in Utah. Um, it's, it's bounded on the, where's mine? It's bounded on basically on this side by a mountain range and on this side by like the Great Salt Lake, uh, kind of particularly up in this area in here. So it's a very kind of north-south orientation. Um, primarily automobile network runs with I-15 um, that runs through this area. A lot of the population is really dense along the I-15 corridor. Um, and then there's bus and light rail services um, that are being provided by UTA within here, as well as commuter rail on that north-south access. But we didn't look at the, the commuter rail portion, just the bus and the light rail uh, services. There's also um, a curb-to-curb -curb paratransit service reserved for people with, uh, with uh, disabilities, uh, different types of impairments. Um, but we did not look at the paratransit. We were looking at the fixed route services uh, within this area. So um, to do the index of transit supply or provision, uh, just the ITP we call it, we really looked at three different things. Um, we, using UTA data, essentially we mapped all of the bus stops within the uh, service area. And then we looked at the basically 1,300, 1,255 census block groups within this study area. And we looked at the area around of each, the percentage of the area of each block group that was within walking distance of a bus or a light rail stop, within about 400 meters of a bus or light rail stop. And that's the, the D factor here. Um, it's just the percent of each block group within walking distance of a bus or light rail stop. Um, the, the F factor that we're using here, that's the mean frequency of transit mode stops per day um, for each block group just how often a, a bus um, was stopping at each one of those stops um, for each census block group. And then um, the other factor we use is essentially a ridership capacity factor where we use the um, uh, UTA's data uh, where we could see the, uh, how many people were on the bus or the, uh, the light rail um, at each stop with the capacity of the vehicle. So we could see what the, the unused capacity was of each one of these vehicles at each stop. Um, so we could just, uh, it basically is a measure of um, passenger load per day, which gave, gave us um, uh, the, the mean excess passenger capacity for each stop. Um, and then we calculated this for each uh, census block group. I've got multiple pointers here. I don't know which one to use. All right. Um, and then it's kind of a simplistic factor or a simplistic formula. So when we did it, we basically, we, we 
calculated all this um, for each of these, but then we standardized it as a z-score uh, just for comparison purposes. And if we were to look at that, this is for the roughly 12, 1300 census block groups in the area. And you can see those areas, the darker green, um, have higher uh, amount basically of transit supply, of, of capacity to move people each day. Um, so that's what would basically it was in uh, person trips per day. So, you know, there's a lot of excess person trips per day capacity in the darker green areas. There actually wasn't, and I'm, I'm not going to subject you to the table, but when we looked at these, um, we didn't really have any areas that were very low or low. So we basically did very low, low, below average, you know, zero disparity, and then average, um, above average, very and very high. In other words, Oh, it's back. <laughs> nice try. Um, yeah, all right. So all of a sudden the computer is like, just be done. So, um, uh, but anyway, I mean, you can just see there's a lot of capacity along essentially what you're looking at in through here. This is the I-15 corridor and the densest part of the area. And that's where the majority of the capacity is. And I'm, I'm just going to go a little faster. This uh, looks... A little different, but it's basically addition. Um, so the index of transportation need, again, this was uh, two, two things, people-based index of socioeconomic factors. And just to look, go through, that's the, that's the D and the E and the Y and the U and the, all that. But we were essentially looking at, for each census block group uh, population, the number of individuals with disabilities, the number of individuals 65 years of age or older, um, the unemployed, uh, number of individuals with high school education or less, those whose income was below the federal poverty line, um, and the households without access to a private automobile. And basically we're looking at kind of the mean of those and then, and then for, based on the uh, transportation studies in that area, the number of trips per day that the population um, on average was taking. And then, so that's all kind of pretty standard with that and this. But then we added essentially this land use based measure, which was an entropy score that measured the diversity of land use within the uh, census block group. And we used six different land uses. And if all six land uses were equally, um, uh, were e equal proportions or percentage of the, uh, the, land, uh, the census block group's land area, basically you'd have a higher entropy score. So the more land use, um, diversity and mix that we had, the assumption is that that's been shown um, to basically support pedestrian um, activity. So, you know, if, if where you live is close to where you can work versus where you can shop versus where you can recreate kinds of things, um, then you're much more likely to be able to access those without the need for private transportation because you can walk um, to those areas depending on, you know, of course, the geographic uh, uh, extent. But um, so we really use this land use based measures, activity oppor opportunity accessibility. So it's the diversity of these land uses um, of residential, retail, and certain different types of residential, retail and services, um, commercial and professional offices, um, industry, institutional, educational, um, these kinds of activities. Um, and then what really happens is. So we, we, for each census block group, we'd have the number of individuals who are essentially are associated with transportation disparity or disadvantage, the number of trips per day that these individuals would likely be engaged in. Then we took the inverse of this entropy score uh, because the more diverse the land uses are, the less likely you would actually need um, public transportation to, to access some of these areas. So it would actually lower the number of person trips per day that were necessary in that area. Um, and we uh, basically could calculate it. And I'm in, so we'd have, we basically would have this. So there are some areas with very high transit need. Um, and then there are areas with very low transit need, uh, kind of based on these factors. Um, and then essentially, and again, we did that as a Z-score, and then we just compared them. Um, and forgive me for going 
uh, very quickly through here, but essentially we compared them and we were able to um, look at just the, uh, create an index of uh, transit disparity, which the red areas have very high disparity. Um, there's a lot of need and less supply. Um, and then it goes in towards the green areas, um, there's less need and very high supply of, of transit. Um, and you can you see it, some of what is actually is not surprising because in an area like this, this is essentially just a very rural area um, and there's not really any um, transit uh, that's being provided in that area, but yet it's a very rural area and lower socioeconomic um, level, there's more need in that area, but there is no um, supply. Some of the areas were a little bit surprising because there are some areas with very high need in areas that have very high supply um, as well. Uh, but the need was so great um, in those areas that we see the high um, disparity as well. So bottom line, um, we wanted, uh, if we looked at this for uh, individuals with disabilities um, and for UTA, essentially UTA was providing a kind of a minimum level of service that's, that was effective. I mean, it, it was meeting a lot of the need throughout the area, um, although slight, slightly below average. Um, but, and that's kind of really reflective of perhaps some of the, um, the demand-based, uh, it's cor kind of correlated with population levels, kind of reflects this demand utility approach uh, that had been used in transportation planning in, in, with UTA. So generally it was doing, you know, an effective, although slightly below average uh, job of doing that, but, um, but it wasn't adequately meeting a lot of the need that individuals with disabilities might have. Um, you know, the majority of the population lived in, air, of the total population lived in areas with below average transit provision. Um, but 54% of the population with people with disabilities resided in areas with above average um, transit need, where only 49% of the total population resided in those same areas. So there were more individuals with disabilities living in areas with above average transit need. Um, and about 59% of individuals with disabilities were doing so in areas with, gr were living in areas with greater than average transit disparity. Um, so we were much more likely to find, uh, or more likely to find individuals with disabilities in these areas. Uh, for UTA's purposes, we're able to identify um, 26 out of the uh, uh, basically 1,200 and something um, census block groups that had very high need um, and below average uh, transit provision. So these are the areas that UTA now essentially could look at um, in targeting additional transit um, supply to meet the need uh, in those areas based on socioeconomic and land use factors. Um, and UTA, basically this is what they could look at first to address some of those and while well, I'm not going to show the, next, the other slide, they can reallocate some of the resources in areas with very high provision but very low need. They can reallocate some of that to address these areas to try and create a much more um, equitable. And in some of these areas, um, you know, these are areas with uh, a lot of growth that's happening in the Wasatch Front. <coughs> uh, a lot of growth in particular and a lot of a sprawl that's basically occurring. Um, and you are seeing that and, and need to really kind of address those areas. So the, the really the practicality of, of considering individuals' disabilities and other disadvantaged populations can be addressed by this method um, that's described for the study, although there are a number of limitations and things that need to be improved, like some of the temporal pattern um, of meeting the uh, transit needs. Um, but in general, you know, the study's approach was pretty straightforward, something that uh, UTA could, could implement, um, and it was based on, you know, available data within the region and produced meaningful results that be, could be used to uh, more fully consider individual disabilities, other transportation disadvantaged populations in the planning and management of public transportation systems in the Wasatch Front. And I had better leave it there because I have 15 seconds left out of my 20 minutes. So, questions? 
for 13 seconds. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it, in some respects, and I'll be very honest, in some respects this approach is a little bit simplistic based on what you, we would find in some of the research that's been approached, but it was purposeful because we used readily available data so that it would be easy to transfer. Um, so it's essentially census data and ridership data and land use data from like the assessor's office kinds of things. So it wouldn't be hard to transfer at all. And that was, you know, a decision that we made. The temporal aspects become very hard to, to transfer. So, and, and I will say one of the limitations, the more rural the area, I think the less, act, the, the less valuable it's going to be because even if the, the because of the, the way we're measuring land use, if it's a much larger extent, um, that land use measurement is not going to be as accurate for like large census block groups versus smaller census block groups. And where they're population dependent in a more rural area, it's going to be a little bit less effective. So. All right. Thank you very much. All right.